my goodness, there's just so much talent in this house. They've given themselves over to the Lord, and it is evident. We're so glad to have you here to our online community. We want to welcome you to Covenant Church. This is our Colleyville location. To all of you who are new with us today, we are so glad to have you here. Thank the Lord that you're here. And to all of our regulars, man, this is, we couldn't do any of this without you and your commitment to the vision, your consistent church attendance. Thank you so much. God bless you all. Today, the title of my message is, Where is my King? Where is my King? Our text is going to be found in Matthew, the second chapter, verses uh, 1 through 12. Let's begin reading. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem. So there's something here that is not written in the text, but so that you'll get an understanding. These wise men saw something happening in the heavens about two years ago. So when we get to this point of telling this story, Jesus is not the baby in the manger now. He's a little toddler in the house. But they saw the star when he was first born, the same one that the angels sung about and the same one that the shepherds saw and, and all the glorious things that happened at his birth. And so the wise men from the east came to Jerusalem saying, where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we have seen not a star, but we have seen his star in the east and have come to worship him. There was something about the star that was different than anything else, different than all of the other stars that had traversed the, the sky and and gone and made its course throughout history, they saw the star and it caught their attention like none other. And verse 3, when Herod the king heard this, he was troubled and all Jerusalem with him. Why was he troubled? Because Herod was a madman. Herod had had some of his own family members killed because he was concerned that they were plotting to take the, the throne. Herod was a despot. Herod would make irrational, dumb decisions that would cost people their lives because of his insecurity and the fact that he was just demonic in every way. So when Herod got messed up because the wise men said there's a new king, he's troubled, he's concerned, he's going crazy. So when the king is all messed up, then the entire city is as well. There's tension galore in this moment. Verse 4, and when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. So they said to him, in Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet. And then they quote from Micah, but you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are not the least among the rulers of Judah. You're not the least among the rulers. You're not the least of the cities. Bethlehem or Jer Israel had great cities. There was Jerusalem, which was the, the capital of the nation. There was Gilgal, where significant things in the Old Testament happened. There was Shiloh, where the, the first uh, tabernacle was set up, the first altar. You've got all of these other cities that have great history. And here's Bethlehem. And the prophet said, you're not the least among them, for out of you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Let me just give you just a little sidebar on Bethlehem. Bethlehem was significant for several reasons. Number one, Bethlehem is where Saul and David, the first two kings of Israel, were born. So now it is fitting now that another king is arising out of Bethlehem. Bethlehem is the place where Jacob and uh, Rachel were having their last child, and Rachel was having trouble in the childbirth. And as she delivered the boy, the baby boy, she names him the son of my sorrow. But Jacob, the father, says, no, that's not his name. His name is going to be son of my right hand. He is the son of my strength. So we even see from a prophetic standpoint that Bethlehem is, is a type of what Christ is going to represent. He's going to represent sorrow because he's going to be crushed 
because of our sin. He's going to bear the weight and the pressure and the expectation of the whole world. But on the other side of that, he is the son, the only begotten son of the most high God. So there's sorrow and there's victory. There is devastation, but there is triumph right there in Bethlehem. Bethlehem is also the place where Boaz and Ruth met. You know that story. I don't have time to go into it, but Boaz was the kinsman redeemer for Ruth who was a foreigner. And they started their relationship, and from that lineage came King David. But Bethlehem is the place where the kinsman redeemer arises. And what is Jesus going to do? He's going to become our redeemer. He's going to save us from our sins. He's going to purchase us out of darkness and move us into his own presence. So Bethlehem, you're not the least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod, when he had secretly called the wise men, determined from them what time the star appeared. When did you all see this star? And they said, well, it was about two years ago. It's the first time we saw it. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, go and search carefully for the young child. And when you have found him, bring back word to me that I may come and worship him also. And when they heard the king, they departed. And behold, the star which they had seen in the east went before them till it came and stood over where the young child was. And when they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceedingly great joy. I'm telling you, they threw a party. It would be like winning the 6A Division I state championship, football championship in Texas. It would be like the party that Alito threw yesterday for securing their ninth football title. Set the record. and they, they were happy. Verse 11. And when they had come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary, his mother. See, not, not a baby, not a manger, not a feeding trough. But now they are in a house and he's a toddler, probably about two years old. And he fell down. And they fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented gifts to him, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Then being divinely warned in a dream that they should not return to Herod, they departed for their own country another way. There are three things that I want to extract from this passage that we just saw. And I hope that it will challenge you in your search for your king. Where is my king? The first thing is the wise men came. The wise men came. They saw something, and that something that they saw put something inside of them that moved them to action. You see, there's much conjecture about the origin of these wise men, and some scholars say that the Magi can be traced all the way back to Abraham, which is interesting that it's a a lineage of priests who were connected to Abraham. So perhaps what they knew was they heard the biblical stories. They heard the prophecies that one day there is going to be one who's going to rise among us and he's going to redeem us from our sins and he's going to lead the people of Israel. And that story is passed down from one generation to the next. The first historical reference of the Magi is by a a gentleman named Herodotus who indicated that the Magi were a sacred cast of the Medes. And if that is true, then that would mean that these wise men would have to have traveled anywhere from 1,000 to 1,200 miles to get to this place. Now, when we talk talk about 1,000 or 1,200 miles and travel, we think in terms of our own uh, culture and our own experience, that's a, a few hours on a plane. Or it's a couple days, a few days in a car. For them, that was a journey that would take months and months and months. Why? Because in all of our stories that we've ever seen in history, second evening star missionary Baptist church with the kids coming in with a little paper donkey on their head and a little camel hump on their back. We always saw where it was just like three people and just a little small entourage. No, they recognize that they're coming to worship a king. And guess what? They have extravagant gifts. So it is an entourage. There are, who knows, 20, 30, 40, 50 camels. 
their supplies that have to last them for the length of this 1,200 mile journey. They have to concern themselves with enough food, enough supplies. They have to concern themselves with enough resource in case they run into bandits along the way. They have to have a security team. There is an entourage, so there are a lot of people. How can we speculate that? Because I don't believe they had an audience with Herod when, they came, Herod when they came into the city. I just believe that the entourage was so magnanimous, so big, that Herod had heard about it. And then he inquired what they were doing there. It was huge. And so here is one of the things that I want you to know, that this was not an easy trip for them. But the wise men in search of the king, they came. Now... Something dawned on me when I was studying and preparing for this. A question popped up in my mind. If that star was as big as it was or as obvious as it was, why didn't other people respond to that? Have you ever thought about that? So why do these guys who are traveling 1,200 miles take more interest in a sign in the heavens and other people around them didn't? You see, the star in the heavens was a sign. It was a guidepost, but it was ignored by most of the people. It's up there. Oh, that's a phenomenon. Oh, that's interesting. Then we just go right on back by our work. See, we, we can't in any way castigate the individuals for not recognizing the sign because we have signs all around us that we ignore. You see, Jesus has been redeemed. Jesus has taken our sins upon himself. He went to the cross. He was buried and was raised from the dead. And then we have this 2,000 plus history of him having done something great in one generation to the next, people proclaiming an encounter with God, a transformation by the presence of God. And yet those signs all around us, we still ignore them. But let's not talk about the, the general population. Let's talk about you. Let's talk about me. What are the signs that God's giving us? What is is God putting right in front of us right now that is a guidepost that's directing you to him, that's showing you how to have a relationship, how to have communion and fellowship with him that we're ignoring? Do we get to a place where we get so distracted by the cares of the world? Interestingly enough, you can go into the restaurant today and you'll see family sitting and everybody's on their phone. Just distractions galore when there are things readily available that will connect you to God if you are looking. See, the wise men came because they were looking. They saw something and they had something happen on the inside of them that propelled them to now, I'm going to go search this out. Are you in a place now where God's dealing with you about some things? Maybe in your life there's an unsettling going on. You ever been in that situation where you say to yourself, Say to, say to yourself, something's not wrong. Something's just not right. And you can't put your, your thumb on it. You ever been there before? Well, maybe that's God stirring something up because what he's trying to do is to get you to change location, to change where you are, to go to a whole new place. Because the wise men came in search of the king. Now, here's the other thing about the wise men. When they came, they were not concerned about how far the journey was. They didn't concern about what the resource was, what it was going to cost them. They weren't concerned about the expense. They got themselves prepared to meet this king that they sensed in their spirit they would encounter. You see, too many people now concerned about what it will cost if you follow after the Lord. I shared this story, uh, Seth has completed his first semester of college, and we thank God for the opportunity to, to get an extended education. But he said, Dad, uh, on the first day in one of these classes, he said we had to write a paper, and it was basically about us and what we believe. And he said, and I took a very bold stand about my belief in Christ and who he is and what he's meant in my life. And he says, and the professor didn't take too kindly about his value systems. And so he said it was a turbulent journey, turbulent journey the entire semester. 
But let me tell you what he did. He counted the cost. Here's my question to you. Have you counted the cost? Have you weighed out what it's going to take to follow God, to stay connected to Christ, to, to give your life over to him? And here's what I can tell you is that there's no price too great. The disciples were concerned about that. They said to Jesus, they said, Jesus, we've left everything to follow you. And Jesus' response was, well, you've left everything, but here's what I'm going to tell you. The person who's left everything for my cause, he says, it will be returned in this life and in the life to come. See, here's the bottom line is God, when we count the cost and we come into relationship and communion and fellowship with him, we don't lose anything. We gain everything. Can you say amen to that? We do. This is why Sid and I are tithers. We tithe because we understand this, that we give God 10% of our income, and he takes that 90% that remains, and he stretches that more than 100%. Why? Because it, it's impossible to outdo God. And so they came, and they didn't concern themselves with the cost. Here's the, the second thing, is they worship. The wise men worshipped. Another thought that dawned on me. So Herod hears that they're here and they're looking for the king. He calls the priests and the scribes. These are individuals who have studied the word of God. They know the scriptures inside and out. Their life has been dedicated to that since they were about two years old. They are the ones who distinguish themselves scholarly in a way greater than anybody else in the community. So Herod says, where is the king going to be born? And they say in Bethlehem. Have you ever asked yourself this question? If the wise men who traveled some 1,200 miles came to, to see and to find this king, why the people who had dedicated their lives who were only about six to seven miles from Bethlehem, why didn't they say to the king, I'm following you. I want to see this too. Oh, I'm so excited. This is the moment we've been waiting for. They didn't do that. They went. The kings went by themselves. And the scribes and the Pharisees, they stayed home. What do you think that was all about? You know what I think that was all about? I think they were indifferent. I think they were jaded. I think they were apathetic. Maybe they were in a place where they were filled with doubt and unbelief because they had waited for so long. You know how it is when you're expecting something for so long and it doesn't happen, then you just quit believing? Maybe they were in that place. Maybe they were in a comfortable position that they loved their power and they loved their influence and they loved the seat of honor. And for them, if there's a new king, perhaps they won't find favor with this king like they do with Herod. And so now they're going to be dethroned. They're going to be removed out of their position. I don't know. But it is curious to me that the people who've de dedicated themselves to the study of the scripture, when there's an opportunity to find the king, to go to the king, and to worship the king, they don't. Amazing. But we can't, again, denigrate them because perhaps we're in the same spot, that we have an opportunity to worship the king and we choose not to because we're too distracted. Or maybe we don't even go to church on a regular basis or a consistent basis, or maybe we're not in church at all because the place where we got hurt was in the church. And the one thing you don't expect is that you're going to get hurt in the church. Why? Because the people in the church are supposed to be nice. They're supposed to tell the truth. They're supposed to only keep their eyes on their own spouse. They're supposed to not lie. They're supposed to, when you tell them the deepest, darkest secrets of your heart, they're supposed to keep confidence but they don't. You know why? Because the church is the hospital. So everybody who's in the church is sick at some level. Some might have a head cold and others might have cancer. But either way it goes, this is a place to get healed. And here's what I want to just challenge you in. Amen. 
I want to just challenge you in that when you walk into the church, it's a place filled with people who are not healthy, but people who are trying to get healthy. So here's what I'm going to challenge you. I don't want you to get jaded. I don't want you to get turned sideways by some negative experience in church. What I want you to do is give people space to mess up. Just give them space to be human. Give them space to be flawed. Because if you'll do that, you'll keep your heart right. And when the star appears and the wise men come to worship, you'll be the one saying, I'm going to. I'm going to. The wise men came and the wise men worshiped. They were trained to watch the stars, but they were not trained to worship the stars. So they understood it. Have you ever looked at the stars? I remember a couple of years ago when, when Seth and Caleb were in elementary school, they both had this affinity. They wanted to, to Dad, we need a telescope. And, and I knew when they said they needed a telescope, we weren't talking about the $89, $99 telescope from Walmart. So we went and we invested in a very good telescope. That we could see the craters on the moon with such detail and, and we'd get on the, the patio and we'd look at the stars and, and things would capture our, our mind in a distance and we'd put the telescope on and we could see the stars have colors and it looks like they're dancing across the, the canvas of the sky. And it was so beautiful. The shapes and the sizes and the the proximity, proximity and the distance, all of those things. But the wise men were trained to watch the stars. They were, were not trained to worship the stars. They saw something different in this star, and they knew that they had to get to whom the star belonged to. That's why they said, we've seen his star. You see, here's what I can tell you about them in their worship. They weren't looking through natural eyes. They saw with spiritual eyes. We call that perception. Perception is the ability to see what is not obvious. Perception is the ability to see what cannot be seen. Perception is the ability to see something coming down the road and nobody else sees it, but you see it because there's something that you have what we would call that spiritual eye. We call it that eye of faith, that eye of belief. And this is where the, the, the wise men were, that they're on this journey and they've seen that star and they're following it and there's something inside of them that's pulling them and that something inside of them is God. Here's what I can tell you, because they had perception, they didn't see a star, what they saw was a sign. And when they came into the house, they didn't see a kid, they saw a king. And when they came in, what did they do? They worshiped. Question becomes, is that when you encounter the, the Lord and his spirit is drawing you and he's wooing you, the question becomes is are you gonna come? Are, are you going to let go of some things? Are you going to let some relationships go to the wayside? Are you going to let some, some dreams of your own that might not accord with God, are you going to let those go? Are you going to be like the wise men and you're going to come? And then once you say, hey, I'm stripping it all down, I'm letting go, I'm, I'm re getting rid of the weights that, that hold me back. When you come, are you going to worship? Because that's what they did. They came and they worshiped. Then the third thing that they did this is the last point. The wise men gave gifts. They gave gifts. Why did they, were they able to give gifts? They were able to give gifts because they were prepared. They understood this, that you don't show up before a king and not have something to give. It's called honor. It's called reverence. It's called respect. Now here's what I can tell you is that here's what I know about all of us, that God has given us all gifts. And for whatever those gifts are, God has given us the resources to get those gifts used. How do I know? Let's go back to the children of Israel. On the night that they were delivered from the hand of Pharaoh, from the land of Egypt, God says to the children of Israel, he says, go to all of the Egyptians and ask for the gold and the silver. Ask for the fine raiment, the fine garments. Go get it all. 
And they went and they asked them for the resource. And, and the Egyptians, the scripture says, gladly gave it to them. But in a little while after they got out of that situation and God was now bringing them together as a people and as a nation, he says it's time to build a tabernacle. Somebody's been in slavery for 400 years. They don't have any resource. Oh, but wait. They got the resource from the Egyptians the night before they left. So God was saying, go get the gold, go get the silver, because I have a purpose and a plan that's coming down here in the future. And here's what I'm, I want you to know. You're going to have the resource to get the will of God done. Maybe you're in this place today and you're saying, man, I don't know if I can get God's will done. I promise you, you can get God's will done because God has given you a gift. Now, here's what I want you to know is that God doesn't need our gift, but our gift needs God. And what do we do with the gift that God's given us? Whatever that gift might be, it might be the ability to speak well. It might be the ability to, to solve complex problems. It might be the ability to just come alongside somebody and encourage them or to comfort them. It might be uh, whatever it is that you're doing in your life. It might be a gift. Maybe you're just a good friend. When I think about good friends, I think about my friend Dave Romanowski over there. Oh, Dave, Dave and I just got connected because our boys play football together. But every time I hear Dave's voice or I think of Dave, man, there's something inside me just rises up. I just have a good feeling. Dave's a good man. Dave served our country with great honor and distinction. And we love you for that and appreciate you. Come on, let's give Dave a big hand. He used his gifts. We're awesome. We thank you for that, Dave. You know, when I think about uh, gifting again, I, and I use my boys because I'm, you know, we're doing life just like you guys. And here's the reality. So we started the football season, and Caleb said to me, he says, Dad, he says, my theme for this year is to God be the glory. I have a gift as an athlete, and I'm giving that gift back to God. So on yesterday, we got the good news that Caleb made first team all district running back. And when we got that news and he went over to his mom, here's his first words was, mom, I made first team all district running back to God be the glory. Come on. See, it's not just enough that we have gifts, but we recognize they come from God, and, and God doesn't need our gifts, but our gifts need God. And then here's the last thing we have to know about our gifts. Our gifts are not designed to, to build us up and to puff up, us up and to, to cause us to be awesome. The purpose of our gifts is to serve others. So if my gift is not benefiting you and building you up and helping you accomplish the, the purpose and the plan of God for your life, then my gift is useless. I want to just say one more thing. We got my man, uh, uh, come on here. I call him Chess Cole. Man, would you just stand? Just stand right now. This, this guy came to me, how many years ago was it? Maybe four or so. He came to him, and here's what he said. Pastor, I got this musical gift. He says, but I don't think it's supposed to. I want you to keep standing please. He said, I don't think I'm supposed to use this in the church. He said, I'm supposed to use this in the world. And I said to him, I concur with that. See, he's got the ability to write songs. He has the ability to produce music. He is brilliant. He is a genius. And I said, here's, what, here's the plan that we're going to have. You go out and do what you do in the world, but let's stay connected. And when you need to download and you need to come in and, and we need to uh, decompress and, and we need to talk about some things, let's just stay connected. But go out there and do your thing. And in a matter of what, I don't know, it was less than a year, you were sitting with the people on the Latin Grammy committee, weren't you? Just in a short amount of time. So this guy is now running in circles that are absolutely amazing using his gift that he's dedicated to the Lord. Come on, I want you to just extend your hand to him right now. In fact, I feel this for, for all of our musicians. If you have a creative gift, acting, drama, dance, singing, I want you to just stand up right where you are. I just want to prophetically release something. We got Thomas in the house, one of the best saxophone players in, in the world. 
Look at all of these gifts. If you're a kid, if you're a kid, a teenager, come on, and you play the piano, you start playing that, I want you to just stand to your feet. I just believe there's an anointing right here for elevation. Where are you? Come on, kids. I know y'all have got some, we've got some musicians here. I want you to just extend your hand to the Father. We just pray, Lord God, for all of these musicians, for all these creatives, Lord, for all of those who have this gift, Lord God, of drama, of acting, of singing, of, of music. Lord God, of composing and songwriting. Father, we pray that the gifting of the Lord would be increased and enlarged. Lord, open the territories, Lord. Give them markets and give them the hearts and the souls of men and women, Lord, for your glory, for your honor, for your name. In Jesus' name, enlarge them, Lord. Increase their mind. Increase their capacity, Lord, to see what can't be seen. To declare, Father, what you are declaring by your spirit. Make it so, Lord. In Jesus' name. Now, come on, I want you to just hold your hands up, you musician. And I want you to say this. Say, Heavenly Father, I'm giving my gift back to you. To you be the glory for all the things that you're going to do with the gift I give to you. Let it be a blessing to multiply thousands wherever I go. Amen. Amen. Come on, let's give the Lord a hand in this place. So here's the question, where is my king? Where is my king? The wise men, they came and they worshiped and they gave gifts. So where is my king? He's here right now. Let's stand and let's worship the king because he is here right now.